planet has shifted. It has become principally urban. The biosphere is becoming a vast network of megacities on the edge of crisis. The urban population of the planet is increasing at the rate of over one million people a week. Symbol of unlimited growth, of rampant consumerism, New York is overheating. The city must change its model. Imagine a new horizon. The metamorphosis has already begun. It's a green revolution. All of society, the man in the street, the politician, the architect, is now embracing nature, its values, its concepts, its design. And it's becoming the catalyst for the city of tomorrow. By reconnecting with the living world, men are reinventing their city. Will New York change successfully? It has no choice. New York was built on the waterfront. It became an archipelago with five boroughs, five peninsulas linked by bridges over the Hudson, the East River, the ocean, the largest coastline of any metropolis. To fuel its growth, it has destroyed vast forests and contributed generously to global warming. New York has made too many mistakes against nature. Now, it is being punished for its excesses. If the city is here because it's on the ocean, and then the ocean rises, then you see the city, the very thing that made the city could destroy the city. Breaking news. This storm is a rare and extreme event, a category one hurricane merging with an Arctic front. Irene, 2011, Sandy, 2012. The hurricanes hit more violently every time. You need to evacuate. Do not delay. Uh, this is a serious storm, and it potentially have fatal consequences if people have an act. 80 dead in 2012. The subway submerged, electricity cut off, $50 billion of damage, and mud clear up to the windows of Wall Street. And in the storm, New York paddles around in a panic. For the second time in its history, the megalopolis awakens with a weird sensation. Since September 11th, it knew it was vulnerable to men. Now, faced with the elements, it feels fragile. New York's Parks Commissioner reckons this is just the start. We are in grave danger from rising sea level. As storms increase in intensity, as we, get we have had hurricanes and tornadoes in New York, over the last few years that we haven't seen before. If the sea level rises another foot in the next 100 years, that will all be underwater. To Hollywood, it was just another disaster movie scenario. To New Yorkers, even smarter, it was reality. New York City could be swept away at any moment by the very thing that created it, water. Now, New York City has no choice. It's either rethink or drown. But how? The finest architects brought together by MoMA in the Rising Currents Group are seeking a lifesaver. They all agree on one point. To survive, New York must make its peace with nature and make a new alliance with water. In his agency in Tribeca, Adam Yurinsky is at the forefront of this thinking. It was a wake up call for the city. In New York City, the storm surge would enter the harbor through the Verrazano Narrows, and anything in the path of that would be subject to the lateral force of a storm surge of a wave, basically a large wave. So the islands that we created create a buffer zone which can help dampen the force of a wave. Nature is a source of inspiration to us in terms of resilience. Making reefs to slow down waves, 
opening urban estuaries which let water into selected spots in Manhattan. Architects dream of recreating a natural ecosystem to stop the floods. Within the city, Yurinsky dreams up mechanisms and materials which absorb a maximum amount of water, storing it like a sponge in water parks and discharging it as late as possible as the soil would do naturally. Since New Orleans, town planners have seen that levees, however high they are, always give way. There is a before and after Katrina in how we approach cities. New York must work in harmony with water. Together they must form a single organism. That's Yurinsky's message. Other visionaries go even further in coming to the city's help. Landscaper Kate Orff wants to use the most humble of animals. Can the oyster save New York? Our goal is really to kind of harness the biological processes and the biological power of the oyster itself to create not only new sort of physical urban fabrics, but also to um, uh, reconnect New Yorkers with their harbor. The oyster is this amazing animal that essentially can help us address uh, water quality through its biofiltration processes. Um, it can address storm surge through agglomerating into reef structures and attenuating waves. Um, and it also can address sea level rise in that um, it, it, cleaner water and, uh, and slower water mean that you can essentially reset your relationship with that water. By reconnecting with nature, today anything is on the agenda. If a shellfish can spell salvation, then it's up for consideration. In the 19th century, more than a half a million acres of oyster reefs would protect and feed the city, then nicknamed Oyster City. But who remembers that? New York's reinvention should begin with finding out about and understanding its natural history. Some answers lie behind the scenes at the Bronx Zoo. The Bronx Zoo is the refuge of Eric Sanderson, a scientist who has devoted his life to rebuilding the natural history of Manhattan, a Lenape name for Island of Many Hills. Why did the pioneers of New York City settle here at the water's edge 400 years ago? Quite simply, because it was a natural paradise. Sanderson had that intuition before he came up with the proof. I happened to be in a, a large bookstore downtown, and I saw this map. Um, from 200 years ago called the British Headquarters map. And it showed all of the original streams and hills of Manhattan. Well, so I, I tried to imagine if I was an ecologist and I was riding on Henry Hudson's ship, what might I have seen in Manhattan? And what I, what I would have seen is this, is this amazing deep water harbor and this long, thin wooded island that was Manhattan Island, uh, covered with forest and fringed with beaches, with sparkling streams coming down to the shoreline. Manhattan, 400 years ago, was a complete ecological system. It had bears, it had people, it had whales, it had porpoises, it had river otters. It had something that we don't have anywhere in the world today, which is a complete ecological system with all the parts working together to satisfy each other and be part of the ecology of the place. The modern city raised Manhattan's 35 hills to the ground then stretched out over the sea, over its own rubble. It offered itself up to flooding, forgetting its geography at the risk of ending its history. It was in the midst of such wealth that pioneers laid the foundations of the global city. But how, in just a few centuries, were these virtually virgin forests, this wild natural landscape, turned into a forest of glass and concrete? First, they had to eliminate the inhabitants, the Lenape Indians. The natural resources were so abundant that they knew neither hierarchy nor mistrust. They taught nature and hunting techniques to the settlers who then killed them. The pioneers then began intensively hunting beavers. A single boat could carry up to 7,000 pelts to Holland, a natural treasure that helped the city in its rise.
Then the settlers had an extraordinary idea to turn Manhattan, the island with 35 hills, into a geometrical shape, to deny nature, to crush it in order to develop the city in nothing but the city, according to a grid with every last piece chopped up and sold. One of the distinctive characteristics of New York is its grid, what we would call a waffle iron. This grid was so important because it was imposing man on nature. It was saying that with all these trees and hills and streams, we're gonna try to make it flat and we're gonna develop it. In order to develop it, we've gotta lay out streets. And in order to sell the property, because New York was always about making money, we will create streets exactly 200 feet apart. There is an irony here in the sense that nature created the conditions for New York to exist. And then New York, in some sense, in its physical growth, turns against nature to build up all these buildings and tries to forget about it. 150 years later, the famous grid has left its mark on New York like a waffle iron. The forests seem to have given up the ghost, and the city reigns supreme. So what's left of nature? How might it still count in the fate of the Big Apple? David Roseanne is a pioneer of urban ecology, teacher at Cornell University, an ornithologist. He's one of those who opens nature up to New Yorkers. To him, nature is still alive and kicking. Just look into the air. Each year, the birds return in their thousands, and each year, they pay the price. New York is built right in the middle of a migration route. Oh, dear. This bird is, is called a scarlet tanager. It's a South American bird that flies north every spring. The sad thing is you really have to imagine what these birds are going through. Just surviving uh, in the natural environment, in the wilderness, in the rainforest where they spend the winter, um, in the temperate forest where they breed, trying to evade predators, trying to raise their young, flying thousands and thousands of kilometers to get this far north and thousands and thousands of kilometers to fly south again and then slamming into a building. And so this is a, you know, you, this is my favorite bird. So it's to find a dead one sucks. Fucking windows. The New York City was built in the middle of this flyway. And most of the buildings around here have reflective uh, glass, and the birds, the migratory birds at least, the local birds, the starlings, the pigeons, the house sparrows, they figure that out. But the migratory birds really can't perceive glass as such, and they see a reflection of a tree behind them in the window that they're flying into as a tree that they could potentially land on. And before you know it, before they know it, they hit the glass, they're dead. In spring and in autumn, the radars ping like crazy revealing a million passing migrants in the New York City skies. Fooled by the lights or the reflections, 90,000 birds die on the skyscrapers. Nowadays, the buildings are clad in anti-glare glass, and the most powerful city in the world dims its lights several nights a year. The giant decoy is turned off to let a few flights of birds passed from Amazonia from Canada and from the dawn of time. The migratory birds make a pit stop in a wild oasis in the heart of New York. Rarely has the coexistence of wildlife in the city been as precarious as here at Jamaica Bay. On the one side, JFK Airport, with its 1,000 daily takeoffs and landings. On the other, hundreds of thousands of migratory birds, which come and go in the only urban national park in the USA. Between the two stands a question mark. How could an advanced society have built an airport smack in the middle of a migration route? 
Sky sharing is a tricky business, and the number of crashes increases. Jamaica Bay is a nightmare. Jamaica Bay is a miracle. The park is under recurring threat of an airport extension. Each time, NGOs and citizens foil the plans. Biologist Don Reapy has fought all of these battles. Don Reapy is the temple guardian of Jamaica Bay, a temple where between two passing jets, a miracle takes place. The return of birds of prey, the settling of a colony of frightened owls, the spectacle of dancing seagulls. Once a year, when the horseshoe crabs arrive, Don Reapy reconnects with the primitive force of this swamp. This is a living dinosaur. It has not changed its basic shape in 300 million years. It is an ancient primitive animal, a beautiful design, very important ecologically and medically. Yeah. You know, the copper based blood is used to detect impurities in, in our, our blood, you know, if we're getting a transfusion or a vaccine. Nest in the sand at the high tide. And then all the shorebirds feed on the eggs. Mm -hmm. They feed, feed, feed for maybe two weeks. And they double their weight. And they need that fuel to go north to the breeding grounds. If they don't get it, population declines. So this, is, this, has, this is of international importance? International importance, ecological importance. Besides the historical animals which have New York in their genes, other creatures are arriving in the city. By following the railroad tracks, by swimming up the rivers and canals, by working their way across golf courses and cemeteries, a timid animal bursts in the heart of Manhattan. Breaking news. The it wasn't a big bad wolf that park goers were buzzing about, but rather a not so small coyote. First spotted on Sunday, the male canine eluded capture for days as some cops loaded tranquilizer guns. It's going down, it's going down. But the 35 pound male wasn't having it. He jumped an eight foot fence. While pondering the question of where Hal came from, they can tell you where he is going now, back into the wild. In Central Park, Gary Anthony Ramsey, New York One. For biologist Mark Weckel, the arrival of the coyote is a sign. No longer is the city on one side and wild animals on the other. Ecosystems are interlaced. Anything is possible. Honestly, most people don't even realize there are coyotes in New York City. I've talked to a lot of people who are actually really curious about the idea that a fairly large wild animal could actually find itself home in, you know, well, <laughs> this urban mess and that they have seem to be coming in as fast as they are. Ten years ago, when I started my work in um, the city parks, there were no coyotes. And now we're talking about them expanding and moving into Queens. District after district, the coyote is colonizing Gotham City. He comes from far away, in the northern states, where he interbred with wolves before taking on New York. We have a uh, male and a couple female turkeys back here, too. It's from here, an anonymous Bronx park, that coyotes plot their conquest of the city. All right, so this camera, this one has been up for uh, a month. So this is the easy part of the job. All we got to do is take one of these cards back to the laptop and try to see what uh, came by in the last month. There he is, Bronx Coyote, the most southern coyote in the Bronx right here. This is pretty exciting. That's a great shot. There's a scientific reason for doing this study on the Gotham Coyote, the New York City Coyote. Often a scientist, a conservation biologist, is retrospectively trying to figure out, well, how did this big mammal or this bird get to this new place? And they have to figure it out after the fact, after it already got there. And here we have this unique period in history 
where the coyote is on an edge. It's moving its population forward. And that forward is into New York City, into Long Island. So in real time, we can figure out how this animal adapts to urban landscapes. And then being that it's New York City, we have to lock it. The coyotes have reproduced at the junction of two freeways and an airport. They are telling New Yorkers between fear and fascination that two extremes, the wilderness and the world of men, can share the same territory, the city. Under the concrete and steel straitjacket that was claimed to eliminate it, nature is still here, as alive as ever. It is still knocking insistently on the gates of the city. The birds haven't given up their migration. Jamaica Bay is resisting. The coyotes are besieging the city. It was nature which invented New York, and it is still inescapable. New York must accept it, come to terms with it, strike a balance, otherwise it's heading for a crash like in the 60s, when the radical urban model failed. This is the focal point of hard drug addiction in the United States. The urban ghettos house nearly three-fourths of the hardcore addicts, with New York's teeming slums far out in front. When the city was in decline, let's say the 1960s and 1970s, the Bronx and many parts of Brooklyn, and even Manhattan, we're seeing abandoned people just leaving. The ghetto in flames was a backdrop to the childhood of Marjorie Carter, the most committed of environmental activists in the Bronx. When I grew up, much of the buildings around here were literally just shells, burned out shells. We lost, the, the South Bronx lost about 60% of the people that lived here because the building stock was destroyed. To burn their buildings down to collect insurance money because there wasn't any kind of investment available in communities like this one. When the people left and the population went down, there became the opportunity that some space was just empty. And so people from the community came in and just started building little community gardens on them. It wasn't their property, but nobody else was doing anything, so why didn't? That's what we call community gardening. In 1971, on these ruins, an artist named Liz Christie sowed the first seeds of a movement which spread around the world, community gardens. There are now 1,000 such gardens, the green soul of New York City. On these little plots of land, New Yorkers are awakening to nature. More than ever, these are places of utopia and resistance. Gardens where everything is possible, even the return of butterflies to New York, like in a children's fairy tale. Trying to distribute plants throughout the Bronx and actually through the city that attract butterflies and pollinators. All right, take care. To give them a place to live, to eat, to grow. We want fruit and vegetables and, and flowers and, and continued plants. We want all of those things. And we want beauty. And butterflies are beautiful and bees are beautiful. We just, we love these insects. Yeah, that's why they're important. There's lots of research out there that proves that having nature in people's lives, especially in urban areas, um, is incredibly therapeutic. Because when people see um, nature, they have a tendency, their, their stress levels can be lower. Um, kids can do better in school. There's, I mean, if it's beautiful outside, people want to be outside more. So that is even a way to deter crime. <laughs> It's to the 840 acres of Central Park that New Yorkers come to satisfy their desire for nature. But how many of them know that this landscape is a pure product of the mind? Each block, each tree was brought here by man in a magnificent showing of nature. Even the wild animals were swept up in it all. Just like this buzzard, 
who set up his home on one of the most expensive streets in New York with a view of Central Park. The true story of Pale Male achieved urban legend status, given resonance by award-winning documentaries. Oh my God! Pale Male, he has become the most famous hawk in the world. There she comes. <laughs> In their relationship with nature, New Yorkers don't do things by halves. Each year in the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in West Harlem, a strange liturgy rings out, drawing thousands of participants and the creatures of the Lord. To receive the indispensable sacrament, according to Franciscan rites, monkeys, tortoises, llamas, cows and pigs, wild and domesticated animals of every stripe, march to mass. Each year, the list of animals grows. Peace of the Lord be always with you. And God will glorify our celebration of creation this morning. It's important for me to have animals in my life because they are the closest representation of nature and an idea of God, I think. And I feel the presence of that when they're in my house. May the Lord who created you fill you with all blessing and happiness that you may bring joy to those who love you all the days of your life. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello. So I do believe that this turtle has a soul. All animals have a soul. There is something about their life that is precious and beloved, that is more than just biology. At the heart of the most rational city in the world, this is almost a shamanic ceremony. Like this green gorilla throwing seed bombs in the Big Apple, New Yorkers, whether activists, community gardeners, plant or animal lovers, are calling for more nature in their city. It's a light motif, launched by a few ecology pioneers in the 1970s, then taken up eagerly by charities, NGOs, and naturalists. Today, it's a groundswell that affects politicians, town planners, and anyone involved in building tomorrow's city. We're in the, uh, perhaps one of the largest periods of park expansion and development where we are repurposing the old industrial landscape. We don't have a lot of empty land, open land, to make parks in New York. So we take the old industrial landscape along the rivers, the brown fields, the polluted areas, the garbage dumps, the abandoned railroad tracks, and we're turning that into the new parks for the 21st century. So now, the era of the facelift is upon us the metamorphosis of New York's glorious industrial past into green spaces. And then there's another 300 or 400 hectares of new parks that we have added. The West Side waterfront, the old shipping piers, the old terminals around Brooklyn Bridge have been turned into Brooklyn Bridge Park. The industrial waterfront in Greenpoint in Williamsburg is being turned into park. So everywhere across the city, new parks are being built on what used to be industrial wasteland. Fresh Kills by itself is close to 1,000 hectares. Fresh Kills is the fabulous story that no one in New York tires of. A modern day fable, taking the most stinking rubbish dump in the world, fueled by 29,500 tons of waste, discharged every day for 25 years on a magnificent natural site, Staten Island swamps. Cover it with a tarp, stick pipes in to recover the methane, leave a thin layer of soil, plant in it, and ask the most famous designer in New York, James Corner, to inject some elegance. Spurred on by the new green consciousness, the biggest ecological conversion of the planet is underway at Fresh Kills. It will take 20 years. Officials say it will end when a child can eat the soil without being poisoned. To reinvent the nature it destroyed, New York is capable of miracles. 
But these urban ecology miracles would have never reached boroughs like the Bronx if it weren't for Marjorie Carter's mission, environmental justice. I grew up six blocks away from here and had no idea that a real river was in my backyard. This, when we created this park, this was the first time this community had had access to our waterfront in more than 60 years. And then we were able to continue to transform the environment from what used to be a dump into this beautiful slice of nature that we have in front of us. So they got to be reconnected to the river and reconnected to the land in a way that we hadn't in more than decades. This is a beautiful example of greening the ghetto. It's so small, it can't really bite. Let me see if I see one. Wow. It has a beard! Oh no, it has a beard! <laughs> Through the middle of the Bronx runs the only true river in New York, the one the Indians called the River of High Cliffs. For centuries on, kids are rediscovering it on boats built by the charity Rocking the Boat. The high cliffs of waste are slowly diminishing, little by little, the face of the Bronx is changing. The river has brought the children of the ghetto into the great cycle of nature. Here in the Bronx, where gangs mark out their territory with sneakers, environmental justice has its work cut out. Gang crazy, fitty cat crazy. Money real puffy and my jeans can't stop. Far from the Bronx and its stumps, in the heart of Manhattan, Venepi announces the new generation of urban parks, in which the city is investing $5 billion. This is not just a good thing to do, it's a very necessary thing to do. Parks can't simply be beautiful places where you go and see a reproduction of nature. They have to be functioning landscapes. They have to have a, a higher function. They have to work for you. So now we have new guidelines for designing parks for high impact, high performance landscapes. Brooklyn Bridge Park is a model of its kind. Built on layers of recycled material, it stores rainwater, produces its own energy, and limits the effect of heat waves on New York, thanks to tailor-made vegetation. These high-tech parks are a flagship of Plan YC 2030, launched to satisfy New Yorkers' seemingly endless thirst for nature. They are there to help New York to breathe, to defend it from flooding. The authorities have committed to creating a park 10 minutes from every inhabitant, planting one million trees and limiting the greenhouse effect. These virtuous declarations are received with skepticism around Brooks Park, a self-proclaimed Zapatista community garden. They sow criticisms of the system to harvest the spirit of resistance. The current administration does a great job of greenwashing their reputation, but their green initiatives are basically real estate initiatives to create avenues of access and beautification for high-end real estate and condominium and hotel development. They're spending $200 million on the High Line in New York City, which is featured worldwide, but there has not been a law passed to preserve community gardens like ours in the South Bronx. So if they were really serious about green space initiatives, they would create a law to preserve all the gardens that exist and a mechanism to create more. Will the politicians really change New York with recycled rubbish tips and futuristic parks? The city has already taken one great leap forward. In the 1970s, it was bottoming out pollution-wise. The politicians put their foot down. Once again, the city reinvented itself and nature returned. Biologist, port historian, and fishing enthusiast John Waldman remembers the renewal of New York City waters. I've been fishing on and off around New York Harbor for most of my life, but when I would drive along this highway in the 1960s, I would look out and see big oil slicks, big sheets of oil and gasoline, and I would see human, human waste floating around. And he didn't want to fish here, and there was not much fish life. It wasn't until 
after 1972 when the waters became cleaner that people realized there were a lot of fish here to be caught. And since then, we have people who are making a living bringing people out to fish in New York Harbor. That would have been unheard of in the 1950s, the 1940s. It would have been considered a joke. In the 1930s, New York was beginning to expand out onto its own waste, endlessly thrown into the sea until it made a plinth for its expansion. For a long time, words like pollution or environment were banned from the vocabulary of a city obsessed with development. It wasn't until the Clean Water Act of 1970 that things began to change. Water pollution becomes a serious crime. Water treatment stations blossom. They now number 14, flanked by huge sludge boats, as they're known. They treat the water from the sewers, New York's third largest river in terms of flow rate. The results can be felt at the end of John Waldman's line. We have about 200 different fish species in New York Harbor. This area is a very good migratory highway for a lot of fish. They come from the ocean and come through here, right past Manhattan, big sturgeon and striped bass and shad and, and bluefish, and they come up and go through the East River to migrate to New England. So this is like a highway for fish here. How much has nature really returned? Waldman and his team of volunteers are going to analyze the most urban of waterways, the Bronx River. With the communities looking on, fishermen hooked up to 50 volts search the river with a fine tooth comb for the first time. American eel. 27 centimeters. I think it's marvelous that the eels we're catching here were born a thousand miles away in the deep Atlantic Ocean, an area called the Sargasso Sea. So we are in the middle of the urban Bronx, and we're finding connection to an ecosystem that is a thousand miles from here. It couldn't be more different, the open ocean. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. The fish reconnect the city with far-flung horizons. The eel's great journey strikes a chord with the urbanites of the Bronx. This is what they look like. This is, this is a big one. I don't think it's unique. I just think it's been undiscovered. I think it's been forgotten. I think the fish and the, the life has always been here. We're just starting to peel back and uncover what was always here. And as you clean up, more and more are coming. Clean it up and they will come. And that's really what's happening. The inventory wouldn't be complete without a species common to the neighborhood, the dirty gun used to settle scores. Five hundred meters upstream, two New Yorker naturalists on the trail of the Bronx giant turtle. This animal symbolizes nature's obstinacy. He digested all the pollution and waited until his river knew better days. He's the favorite of Eric and Peter, who alone know his lair. Right here. Right here. <laughs> Look. 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 See. This one's probably 16. about a 17, a 16, 17. That's, yeah, that's, a, that's, that's, that's a big, big one. Yeah, this is big, but now this is, this is about as big as they get. But here in the Bronx, you get a lot of them this size. Yeah, the good news is there's a lot of big old turtles that are surviving pollution in the Bronx mm -hmm. River. They don't die in levels of pollution that they're supposed to die in. So this animal right here, 30, 40 years old, is probably, if, if, I, if you ate this, you probably would be cool. Yeah, man. So that thing has accumulated so much toxic, so it's basically by EPA standards, that is toxic That's waste. To exactly. On the industrial site of Newton Creek, 
the eco-artists of the Island Company give a spirited rendition of the migration of fish, of the birds. Under their feet is soil, force-fed with 200,000 cubic meters of oil, around twice the slick of the Exxon Valdez. Thanks to unlimited credits voted by the government, nature is gradually returning to this land of crude. They celebrate in their way a city triumphing over its demons like extreme pollution, a city where citizens can make a breach in the mineral, a city where politicians can recast industrial landscapes as parks, a city where biodiversity gives birth to another city. Once again, New York begins to dream. What if nature became the main attraction? What if nature became the star? The investigation continues in the Chinese districts of Manhattan, then Queens. From flying lizards to seahorses, Himalayan mushrooms and dried grass snakes, Chinese dispensaries teem with biodiversity. Both pharmacopoeia and gastronomy are fed by nature imported from all corners of the world. The nature of New York is what drives Peter Warney, the craziest and most keen urban naturalist. Each day, he feeds his subjects in his laboratory made to resemble the city's ecosystem. A place for learning about nature and admiring his collection of oddities. Hello, everybody. All my friends. Let's see how the Bronx River tank is feeling today. This is what the Bronx River looks like. Lots of Brooklyn beer bottles and garbage and algae floating around. We're going to see how this little the snapping turtle who lives in the the Bronx River. People often ask why I have so many exotic species from Australian snake neck turtles and animals from Africa and all over the world. Well, there's a couple reasons why. Ecology has changed. Now, in urban environments, the food chains are exotic species-based food chains. So the world is changing very fast, and so is natural history, especially in urban cities. You like cockroaches? Ah, bite him, not mine. Ah, boy, that went down fast. A complex new ecological order has been established in New York. Animals from all over the world coexist in a biological layer cake, enriched by the contact with humans. This changing natural world is evolving in a city that's becoming ever greener, but which has swallowed the surrounding countryside to merge with other major conurbations. It's the ecosystem of the third millennium. New York has undergone an environmental facelift, but it hasn't resolved the essential issue. It's still a hyper-consumer devouring food, natural resources, and energy sucked in from the rest of the world. If everyone on Earth lived like the average New Yorker, it would require the resources of five to six planet Earths it's the digital footprint of New York, and it is no longer acceptable. To lighten its ecological footprint, New York must change its metabolism. It's the whole city that needs to be reorganized from top to bottom. Architect Michael Sorkin, with his firm Terraform, is one of the boldest thinkers in the New York of tomorrow. He has begun to write the encyclopedia of a sustainable, self-sufficient New York. The ecological footprint of New York, uh, regionally speaking, is the size of France. So um, this is obviously unsustainable. We are thinking about ways in which these footprints can be shrunk. Obviously, um, simply shrinking our footprint is not enough. What we're doing is to try to determine whether or not it is possible for New York City to be completely self-sufficient. 
that is to say, whether its ecological footprint can be the same as its political footprint. So we've been investigating the different respiratory functions of the city, including the production of food and oxygen and uh, the carbon cycle, water, waste, construction, employment, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We are looking uh, to think about um, the forms that the city could take in the future. We look at pieces of infrastructure that can be converted. For example, we're, we're doing one volume about transportation, and part of the assumption is that the automobile is a doomed technology, and much of this space becomes available to us. So the giant freeways could become uh, uh, avenues of vert vertical agriculture. Um, the rail yards can be decked over and, and become agricultural zones. But one of the things that we've investigated in the course of this uh, project is something that we've been calling the figure ground switch. This is a preposterous exercise, but um, what we uh, are doing is demonstrating that it is in fact possible for different kinds of functions for New York City to become self-sufficient. But in this steel and glass babble, how can this idea live? Urban agriculture is trying to respond to the desire of creating a self-sufficient city 40 years after the community gardens, New York invents rooftop farms. It has now become the reference in the matter. Skyscraper farmers are becoming more and more numerous, like those of the Brooklyn Grange Farm, pioneers in the field. This kind of agriculture is still a bit elitist. The environmental benefits are still just symbolic, but it is a good start. More and more furrows are being plowed in the skies. On the roofs and on waste ground, Gotham City farming potential stacks up to offer four times the area of Central Park. That's a lot, but it's still not enough. So the NYC Ideas Labs started mulling over the problem to come up with better, vertical farming. On paper, vertical farms have all the qualities needed, space saving, transport reducing, and energy self-sufficiency, but none has yet left the drawing board for lack of funds. Inventor of the concept, Dixon Depomier reckons a skyscraper farm will set you back $30 million. But this utopia is growing strongly, and in the wackiest of ways. The challenge for architects is to build a building that works as well as a forest. Right? And does the carbon cycle and the water cycle and the habitat as well as the forest does while still providing all the amenities we want out of the building? And um, my experience of designers in New York City is if you can give them an example of where we want to go, they are so creative that they can find a way to make it happen. For the future of New York, the architect Vincent Caibo dreamt up an enormous dragonfly wing. Notre but dans Dragonfly, c'est en fait en quelque sorte de construire un central park à la verticale et que ce central park soit agrémenté par plein de fonctions qui font la vie d'un quartier. Donc par des épiciers, par des cinémas, par des espaces de bureau, par des espaces de logement, par des crèches, par des piscines suspendues. Le tout est plongé dans un milieu agricole, étagé à la verticale. Et donc je pense que c'est cette richesse de fonctions qui fera la réussite d'un quartier qui se veut être un manifeste de la façon dont on pourra vivre dans le futur. Even if Dragonfly remains at the project stage, this ecological manifesto is already beginning to send its solid spores into the world. Who knows? One day, they may land in New York. I think one of the interesting things about our, our time of cities is that we're reinventing the city again. New York has been reinvented for 400 years, and it's going to be, continue to be reinvented 400 years from now. And so I think if you were to ask a historian what's most important about our time, you know, say somebody who's writing 100 years from now about our time, I think they'll say nature and cities is what we're reconsidering. This kind of sentimental and affectionate relation to the form of nature is a, is a key to our, our um, you know, the future of our souls uh, as well as our survival on the planet.
There were more ecosystems here than in Yellowstone and more birds than in Yosemite. Today, there is a colossus with feet of clay who, in order to evolve, has started to listen to its nature again. In its bid to change, New York is summoning all the ideas, all the technologies, and the main drivers of change are the New Yorkers themselves. A transformation is well and truly underway. The city is unfurling in unsuspected dimensions to offer new spaces to nature, to man, and to agriculture. And on the way, it's inventing new strategies that the whole world is now copying. This city of engineers and creatives is now capable of making nature just as seriously as it used to make industrial objects. It is reconciling extremes. Tomorrow's civilization will be urban. Thanks to New York, it could also be natural.